thanks for all that troubleshooting, Leah. This is crazy, but you know, we've we've had a lot of people who've been very patient and understanding as technology gremlins just do their thing. So um, thank you, and I'm so glad to have you guys with us. And I guess that means that Carrie and I have had a good little practice. Uh, this webinar is something that is really different from what we've done over the last couple months, and and it's something that I think we'll be able to really empower our audience today with some tools that they can go play with. Um, this Veterans History Project is really interesting. And when I first heard of it, I, I had to dive in and start looking up people whose names I knew and looking at family members to see if there was anything in that archive. And, and then thinking about how many people I know that have some great stories that should be submitted for that. So I'm thrilled that we've got some really unique tools to bring to our audience today into the CAF. So Carrie Ward, thanks so much for being with us. Um, Carrie, you are the liaison specialist for the Veterans History Project. Can you give us a brief introduction about yourself, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, as a liaison specialist, that basically means that I get to work on um, developing and implementing different strategies to help build our archival collection. I get to work on different program plans. Um, I get to share some of these really amazing stories with others. And most importantly, I get to travel around and to meet different individuals and organizations and talk to them a little bit about how they could sit down and participate in Veterans History Project and make sure to uh, archive these really important stories. Um, take two, I get to thank you again, as I had mentioned. Thank you so much, Nancy and to you, Leah, uh, both for the invitation and to our diehard fans over there, I wanna say thank you so much for uh, staying with us and sticking it out. And um, I'm really hoping that you're gonna find some really great opportunities to make a really meaningful difference. Um, before we start, I'm going to ask if everyone could do me a favor and just think about who you know who's a veteran. And the first go around, we said probably everybody on here knows a veteran, right? It's possible it, it could be a, a family member. It's possible that it could be a friend, a neighbor, a colleague. Uh, somebody from your place of worship. And Nancy, I get to throw it to you. Who are you thinking of? Well, I was thinking of my grandfather, who was a lieutenant colonel in both the First and the Second World War. And I also have some uncles and, and a number of family members who have served. And I know for a fact that you had an opportunity to talk to them a little bit about some of their service experience. I did. And, and yet, you know, sadly, most of them have passed before I became adult enough to understand the questions I should be asking. Even had a friend that was a Rosie the Riveter and, and didn't understand when I was a teenager what that meant. And so I missed that opportunity to collect those stories. Well, and that's part of why this, this project is so important is because even though less than 1% of our population is currently serving in the military, you can look around and almost everybody out there knows somebody who raised their right hand in service to this country. And every one of those veterans has a story to tell. Um, it does happen rather frequently where a lot of these veterans will be quite humble and they will try to tell us that they didn't do much or they don't have a story to tell. But Again, if you raised your right hand in service to your country, you have a story to tell. And this is a great opportunity to take a peek behind the curtain to learn more about what it was like from those specific individuals who had a front row seat to history. Well, let's take a peek behind that curtain. You know, when I think of the Library of Congress, I think books and you know I think about what I had when I was in university and go down to the basement of the library and all the moldy musty stinky dusty stuff so tell us like why is the veterans history project in the library of congress and this image of a library doesn't look like any library I've really ever seen before now I know that I'm completely biased in this but I do feel like this is the most beautiful building in Washington DC and I would like to take an opportunity to invite anybody who's watching this to plan your next visit as soon as the buildings are open here in Washington DC we would love to have you um, I was telling you earlier Nancy that I actually went through the 16-week docent course because I just felt like the art and the architecture everything was just so beautiful and I wanted to be able to share that with people 
uh, the photos up on the screen provide a really great preview uh, just to kind of whet your appetite for what you'll find at the, the Library of Congress Thomas Jefferson Building. Um, you can see up there we have what we call the Great Hall and then uh, down below we have portions that are taken from the Hall of the Book or the Evolution of Storytelling. And one of the things that I love about this building is this overarching presence of storytelling that's just built within the art and the architecture. And one example of that can actually be seen in the lunettes or tympanons that are featured in the corners of this photo. Um, even before we had these virtual calls or phones or uh, even before Gutenberg's printing press, we had the ability to communicate with each other and to share that story from generation to generation. But similar to the game telephone, things can kind of get a little misconstrued as they get passed down. And that's part of why we feel like it's really important not just to share those stories, but to make sure that they're archived, they are recorded, um, because they provide really great cultural aids so that future generations will better understand what it was like and help us better prepare for the future. The Library of Congress is one of the oldest federal and cultural institutions, and we provide the world's preeminent reservoir of knowledge. Uh, we provide unparalleled integrated resources to Congress and to the American people. I, I'd like to emphasize that because uh, some people forget this is our national library. What that means is this is the people's library. And so we invite you not just to come and see the beautiful art and architecture, but also to use some of the free resources that are available on the website, which is loc.gov. Um, specifically with what we have going on in this climate, you know, we have a lot of really great resources out there that are directed more towards teachers who are having to do this virtually so that they can try to keep up with everything. Um, but if you're anything like me, and as you had mentioned, uh, when you hear library, you think books. You don't necessarily think this beautiful building. And while that is true, we do have a magnificent collection of books. We have a total of 170 million items. And books are just a small fraction of that. We have 39 million books. Uh, included in the other items, we have uh, a wealth of music, not just sheet music, but we also have the uh, Stradivari violins, if anybody's interested in classical music. We have a beautiful concert hall where we invite students from Juilliard to come out and actually show their skills with some of those Stradivari um, in front of a national audience. If you are more so into films, uh, we have the National Film Registry. The cartographers in the group can take a peek at some of the amazing map collections included in that is the uh, Waldemuller map, which is actually up on display in the library. And it is the first map that shows the word America after Amerigo Vespucci. Um, we have a whole division that's strictly prints and photographs. And of course, what we specialize in are those stories and those memories with the uh, Veterans History Project. Well, let's talk about that Veterans History Project. What is the mission of the Veterans History Project? Well, we are a congressionally sponsored program. And what that means is our mission is to collect, preserve, and make accessible those personal recollections of our United States military veterans. And we also want the stories of the Gold Star family members so that they can act as a mouthpiece for their fallen hero. Um, for those who may be wondering what a Gold Star family is, uh, it is a family who lost their loved one to service, whether they became missing in action or if they were killed as a result of their service, they are considered a Gold Star family. Our collections span from World War I up through current conflicts and they cover pretty much everything in between. Um, what we're looking for is really those human experiences. I had mentioned before, you know, we're not as much interested in the facts and the facets of the wars, but rather we're interested in the warrior. We want those those personal stories because hearing all of these variety of different stories really help us to make up the unique tapestry of events and individuals that makes up our national history. So just to, to emphasize that a little bit further, we are not an official military record or archive. Um, that's the National Archives, uh, but rather we are those personal firsthand perspectives from the foxhole, from the ship deck, from the mess hall to the motor pool. Um, 
And when you think about the different books or movies that you watch or read, it's not so much the facts about the war necessarily that you remember, but rather it's those individual stories that paint the picture for all of us. And I kind of feel like it takes a thousand different voices and a thousand different pictures, a thousand different letters to try to tell that story more accurately. Well, and that too is certainly the mission of the CAF. We love telling those stories and we've got a lot of them. So here we go. I mean, this is, this is part of it. These webinars are part of telling those stories. So glad to have this part here. Let's talk about how the Veterans History Project started. Sure. So it's great to hear that the CIF is, is doing, you know, a lot of really great work and has been for a number of years. This isn't the only project out there that's out there trying to collect these stories. Um, but one thing that I love that we do is we offer an opportunity to collect them, have them archived at the library. And then also we do share that with other organizations because we think it's really important to make sure that uh, researchers and students have an opportunity to find these a little bit more easy. Um, but the uh, Veterans History Project started almost 20 years ago, and it was just around this time um, in the year 2000. Representative Ron Kind, who still represents uh, in Wisconsin, was having a Father's Day picnic. And as he's flipping burgers on the barbecue, he overhears his uncle, who was a Korean War veteran, and his father, who was a World War II veteran, start to swap stories. And even though he's grown up with both of these men, he's realizing there's a lot he didn't know. Just like you had mentioned, Nancy, you know, he didn't know what types of questions to ask. But once they got together, they really started to share some of these intimate stories. So Ron Kind pushed pause on the barbecue and ran inside and grabbed that ubiquitous camcorder that most of us had in the year 2000. And he starts recording what they're saying. And he wasn't doing it necessarily just for him to preserve that moment, but he was also hyper aware of the fact that he had two young sons who were playing in the yard. Even if he could corral them long enough to listen to what their, you know, their uh, grandfather and their uncle were saying, there's no way they would understand the magnitude of what was going on in the moment. This would be an opportunity for them to be able to watch it when they're ready. So Representative Ron Kine flew back to Washington, D.C., and by October 27th, the year 2000, we had it written into law to have Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress through the American Folklife Center. And I love to highlight that because June to October, things up here in D.C. do not usually happen that quickly. So we're really grateful that uh, these members of Congress found that there was some value in making sure to collect and preserve these stories. Um, if I could really quickly, I just, I'd love to share some of the stories that are listed up on this screen. Um, yeah, please do. Oh, thank you. Uh, we do have, if you peek around, you can see we have um, Medal of Honor recipients like Vernon Banks, who's up there with the flag. We also have Navajo code talkers. We've got goofballs down at the bottom. We have poets, groundbreakers. Um, you can see what looks like a, a newspaper clipping. That's actually Wendy Cram. Wendy was a shoe in or so they thought, for the gold medal for the Olympics. But after he had learned about the attack on Pearl Harbor, he decided to use his skills in a different way, and he went and joined the ski troops. And um, we also have individuals who had served stateside. Constance Anderson, who's up here in the right-hand corner, was born in uh, Calgary, and then her family had moved her to Utah. I knew you'd like that one. It's my hometown. <laughs> um, she, uh, she had experienced, she grew up during World War II, and um, she was going to school and was in a small school in Utah. And in fact, when she graduated, I think there were 12 girls and 11 boys in her class. And of that, nine of the boys went and enlisted and they joined up so that they could uh, put forth their efforts for the Korean War. Now, not wanting to be outdone by the boys, Constance made sure to go ahead and enlist as well. She originally wanted to join the waves, but as she was born outside of the country, she didn't have her citizenship just yet. So the only branch that would take her was the United States Army. And through that, she was able to get her citizenship and then she was stationed in Washington, D.C. So this photo shows her 
uh, right outside the White House. And she says in her oral history that for the first time ever, she felt like she belonged. Um, let's see. Oh, the couple. I love this. Uh, this lovely couple over here is Tracy Sugarman and his wife, Junie. And uh, Sugarman was a uh, he was with his fraternity brothers. He was singing when he had heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor. He joined the Naval Reserves. And uh, two days after he was commissioned as an officer, he married Junie because that's just what you do. Um, he knew he was shipping off to England and he didn't want to leave her behind. He promised her that he would write every single day and that he did. He wrote her these amazing love letters. And included in that, he uh, he really wanted to work hard to capture that experience for Junie. So every spare moment he had, he had a notepad and he would sketch out his comrades. He would sketch out what the children looked like. He would sketch out the landscape so that he could send it back home to Junie. Now, of course, Tracy Sugarman wasn't exactly doing this, knowing that we were going to have a project like the Veterans History Project um, that would someday be examining these letters and taking a peek at the um, the different sketches that he had did, but instead he really wanted to share that moment with his new bride. Uh, these two examples really showcase the fact that, again, we're not looking for all of those glorious stories, but rather those intimate stories. We really do specialize in that human experience. We want that firsthand look. Uh, we had um, Senator Chuck Hagel, we had interviewed him at one point, and I just love the quote that he said. It was that uh, he had participated in Vietnam, and he said that when we think about the Vietnam War, or any war for that matter, we tend to think of it as a unitary subject. But in reality, there are a million different Vietnam Wars, and this project's a great opportunity to allow us to take a peek to see what that's about. What an incredible mission. I bet you could go on and on about stories, but in the interest of time, let's talk about how our audience can access the resources of the Veteran History Project. Okay, so this is a screenshot of our website. And if anybody is interested, not only in looking at this from an archival standpoint, but also if you're interested in looking at it from a participatory standpoint, we would encourage you to take a peek at this. As you can see, it can be found at loc.gov forward slash vets. And it really is this uh, impactful portal that allows you to really engage with the collections in a variety of different ways. Um, we, let's see, we have a number of different things I wanna highlight here. Uh, one thing is the blog, if you see that little orange with the little B. Uh, we like to showcase our collections as I just was sharing different stories. We like to try to showcase and shine a spotlight on some of these collections through our blog, through our social media with Facebook, um, but also with our Experiencing War web feature, which is an area right here where the, uh, the picture is. Right now we are featuring the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, but we have our reference librarian curate a variety of different themes. So pretty much no matter your interest, you'll find some stories that really will resonate with you there. If you're more into submarines, certainly we have that. We do have wings of war. Um, we have chaplains on a divine mission. A lot of times chaplains get overlooked, but they have a really important role in mission. So I would encourage you to take a peek at that. And um, we will get to the search, but before that, I am gonna just kind of highlight over here where it says uh, print forms and kits, if we could. Yep, let me zoom in on that a little bit. Perfect. Um, so I'd like to make the joke that we have a lot of really great informational materials. We are a library, so should anybody want any bookmarks, we have a number of different bookmarks. Feel free to let me know and I will send you a whole variety. Um, included in that, we also have brochures. And then this white kit is really, really important if you're going to participate in Veterans History Project, and we sure hope that you do. This white field kit is going to be your best friend. Um, inside the field kit, you'll find a synopsis of what I'm talking about today. Basically talks about who we are, why we're doing what we're doing, how you can participate takes you step by step through the participation of the project. Um, included in that, we do have a uh, 
we do have some forms that have to be filled out, uh, release forms from both the veteran and the person who may be conducting the interview. If somebody's choosing to establish their collection through photographs, this is also an area where you can speak more to the specifics of what's listed on those photographs or letters or other documents. Um, and the other thing that we have in there that's extremely important is called the biographical data form. Essentially, it's a DD-214, um, but it has all of the relevant stats on there for the veterans so that we know how it can be categorized throughout our uh, digital archive. I know we're going to talk a little bit more about how one goes about um, archiving and, and sending in, but, but let's just go ahead and go down the rabbit hole because <laughs> I certainly started on this too. Tell us, uh, as we are safe at home in quarantine, how we can search the collection and start looking at people that we know, our family members, our friends, and seeing if their collections are in there. That's great. Um, this is the search button. So back on the main page, once you click the hyperlink that says search, you'll have a page that looks similar to this. And you can see that uh, we've really tried to break it out in a number of different ways so that if you're looking for a specific individual or maybe you can't quite remember their name, but you know that they had served on a specific ship, uh, you can type in some of these locations. You can type in rank. Uh, you can even type in, you know, if you know that they had participated through a, an oral history, you can check box any one of those, and then it will come up with a specific collection. Um, when you search the entire collection, it gets a little bit more specific. And uh, what we do is rather than have all of these collections show up that are World War II, we have them more specific to the veteran. So it's Joe Smith's collection or Jane Smith's collection rather than all of the World War II collections all together. Does that make sense? It does. And Excellent. so once we've done that, what does this look like? So after you've decided that you want to check out Joe Smith's collection, you can click on the hyperlink and the next slide shows. Excellent, Mr. Bryce. Um, so when you find a collection that you're interested in, you can click on the link that pops up on the profile. And uh, this was one that was featured in our Experiencing War. But what it shows is a little folder, and um, this is one that we had extracted a photo from. We call this little folder our baseball card because it does have all of the relevant stats on there. When you click view more information, you can even see who had donated the collection, uh, whether it was an individual who sat down for an interview or if it was CAF. Uh, and therefore, you can click on that hyperlink and see all of the different interviews that the CAF has contributed which is kind of fun. Um, another thing to point out is when you look over at the right-hand side, you find a couple different hyperlinks that show that this was an audio interview. And so you can click on that hyperlink to listen to the audio interview, or you could even choose to download it, which I think is, is kind of nice because I know when I was doing a lot of travel, I wouldn't always have Wi-Fi, so it was great to be able to download that and listen to it at your ease. Um, this is one that's a, a step further, and so it, you can see we actually had this one transcribed. Uh, we work with the National Court Reporters Association and Foundation, and they've been very generous at helping us transcribe over 4,000 different oral histories to make them that much more searchable for the researchers that do use this collections. Um, you can see we pulled out a, a specific quote about Mr. Bryce's service, and we even have a little basic by kind of summary of his experiences listed below. Now, this is one that was featured in our Experiencing War, so not all of the collections are gonna look like this, but I would urge you to take a peek at the Experiencing War. Um, you know, Nancy, you mentioned it is a bit of a rabbit hole and you'll find, you'll, you'll find more and more collections, but feel free to take a look at this as well as some of those within the search. Um, we do work, really, really hard to try to digitize as many of the collections as we receive as possible. Um, that being said, we are certainly at a bit of a backlog, which is not helped by our current situation. Uh, I think last I heard we had two pallets waiting for us when we get back. Um, uh -huh. Job security. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you do find a collection that perhaps is not digitized or you want a little bit more information from, 
I would encourage you to reach out to us. Uh, in fact, you can click the little button that's on the website of Ask a Librarian, or you could email us at BOHP so that we can help with any reference questions. I just have one quick story to tell, and then we'll move on to the next one. But um, it's important to note that this is a grassroots effort. And so as we don't collect all of the, the black and white details that the National Archives have, we really only have the stories of the individuals who participate. So sometimes that means um, you could be looking for a family member or a friend, and if they haven't given their oral history, unfortunately, we won't have it. I would say nine times out of 10 uh, families know that their loved one has participated, but every so often you have somebody who has no idea. Um, and the example I wanna give is there was a, a man named Tom who lived in Dayton and his grandfather had fought in World War II in Korea. And he was scouring the internet with his free time, looking for further information about his grandfather after he had passed away. He was a, he was a kid when his grandfather had passed away. So he didn't really get to know his grandfather. And up pops this Veterans History Project oral history that his local library had done. The family was just shocked. They had no idea because he never talked about his service. They had no idea he participated. But Tom got to sit down and spend 45 minutes getting to know this man who was his grandfather and getting to learn a little bit about what made him tick. Wow, what a treasure. That's great. Well, OK, so we have so many stories yet to tell and and again we need to keep you and and the staff employed so tell us how we would go about um participating in this and and trying to find some oral histories for you and submit them great so uh, i had mentioned that we've been doing this since year 2000 and in the past 20 years we've been We've been pretty busy. Um, as a grassroots effort, we've collected over 110,000 different oral history or different collections, different histories, whether they're oral histories, photographs, and so on. Um, while we are very proud of this number, we're also hyper aware of the fact that there are over 18 million veterans in the United States today. And there's absolutely no way our small team would be able to go out there and collect a lot of these. And so we really do look for individuals and organizations across the country to help us preserve these really treasured memories. Um, I think, you know, we'd mentioned everybody has a unique story to tell, and this is a really great opportunity for both the interviewer and the veteran to help make history. Um, it's a little bit like the, the ripple effect where, of course, it'll impact the two individuals who are involved, but think about all of the other individuals who will be listening to and learning from um, so whether participating as a, a veteran, an interviewer, or simply an advocate for the program, I can absolutely guarantee it will be worth your while. I know, as you've heard, I carry a lot of these stories uh, with me, and I'm hoping that uh, after today you'll feel the same. Excellent. Well, let's talk about the next step then, because it's not just about um, the, the oral histories, but I'm sure you guys have some requirements for submissions and, and that's not just oral histories or doesn't have to include an oral history. Yes, um, you know, everybody chooses to share their story in a slightly different way. Some individuals are gonna be more comfortable talking about it through oral history, while others are gonna prefer to write it down. And then others are going to want to share their personal photographs of what they had experienced. Uh, because of that, we came up with these minimum qualifications. When we first started the project, we were called the Veterans Oral History Project, and we were focused strictly on those World War II histories. But when we started, we didn't have minimums, and we were getting these seven-minute oral histories where all of the researchers and all of the students that used the collection came back to us with so many more questions that, unfortunately, we just weren't able to answer. So we do have these minimums in place so that these collections can be used on a regular basis. And we had worked with an educator who came up with a fun little mnemonic device of 302010 to help us remember what those minimum qualifications are. So um, it, should somebody wish to participate through an oral history, we do have that option. We ask for the oral histories to be either video or audio recordings, whatever's most comfortable for everybody participating. And we ask for that to be a minimum of 30 minutes. 
I feel like, man, 30 minutes may seem a bit long to some people, but I promise you it will fly by. Another way you could establish a collection is through 20 pages or more of original diaries, journals, or unpublished uh, memoirs. And then the last way is through 10 or more original photographs, pieces of two-dimensional artwork or letters, and any combination in between works. So once you hit the minimum qualification for one of those items, the collection is considered open and therefore uh, you don't have to hit the minimums anymore. So you could have a, an hour long oral history and one photograph and that would work, that's great. Or um, you could have a 15 minute oral history and 12 letters, that works too. So any combination of those works. Don't worry about making sure you memorize this. We have all of this information listed out on what I said was gonna be your best friend, that lovely white book, The Field Kit. Um, let's see, uh, one thing I typically encourage though is if you could, not sound like a greedy archive, um, if you could consider contributing more than just one of those items, it certainly is gonna make that collection that much more rich. Um, and sometimes, there are little loopholes. Sometimes people aren't quite ready to part with some of those items, so perhaps you could hold them up on film, on camera, and speak a little bit about those. As we all know, I think uh, photographs and letters, other items from back when you were serving, really help to jog your memory. So it's really great to be able to, to pull those out and to learn a little bit more and spark those memories. Um, just really quickly, I mentioned the field kit. Of course, in the field kit, we have the VHP forms. Another thing that's really important to do before you start the interview is you may want to make sure you know a little bit more about the veteran that you're about to interview. Um, it's also important for you to take some time to build a little bit of rapport, a little bit of relationship with them. It's possible it's somebody you know. You could probably skip this step if that's the case. If it's somebody you don't know, you want to make sure to review those forms with them. Make sure they understand what it is that they're being asked to participate in and answer any questions that they may have. The other thing is if they fill out their biographical data form, you can take that information and you can conduct some additional research so that you'll be able to have some better questions from there. In the field kit, we have uh, really great draft questions. Sometimes people say, oh, 30 minutes, that seems so long. But what we're really after is the full arc of somebody's life, starting with where they were born, what they wanted to be when they were growing up, what other family members maybe had served in the military. Then we get into boot camp. We talk a little bit about if you remember your drill instructor or if you had any other friends that you still have kept in contact with. We talk about your military service. We talk about what came after military service. And then we round out with some reflection period so like I said, those 30 minutes really do fly by. I mentioned draft, they are draft, they are not a checklist. So please do feel free to come up with your own questions. You're gonna know better than, than we do going into it blindly. Um, and sometimes the best question can be what happened next? Because memory is not necessarily working in a chronological format. And so these questions, while they do help give some guidance, really uh, they're just to help kind of get you started. Those are great suggestions. And, and as a, a former teacher, you know, I always believe in do your homework. So it helps to do your homework in advance and, and then have those guiding questions along the way. That's super. So um, our audience has access to veterans, a lot of them with their own stories. So, you know, does this have to be really complex? Do we have to do anything really crazy to pull these stories together? So what's really great is most of us have one of these, cell phone or tablet. You really don't need to be a professional journalist. You don't need to be an oral historian um, in order to conduct one of these interviews. What you do need to be is a good listener. And you need to make sure to carry that best friend, that field kit with you and follow the guidelines that are laid out in there. The number one rule though, is making sure that you are respectful of the veteran's comfort. So you wanna make sure to ask them engaging, but appropriate questions, certainly not any probing questions. Ultimately, this is going to be their story to tell. Um, so you want to be mindful of that and keep any biases that you may have. Uh, you can reserve those and speak about those a little bit later. Um, let's see, uh, a couple of other questions just to kind of 
throw some out there. So again, you know, we're not necessarily looking for uh, the black and white version of what happened in this battle. Um, sometimes the questions that are listed on there, the veteran maybe isn't going to want to go down that path. Ultimately, your job as the interviewer is to make them feel comfortable and to make them feel honored because it is a tremendous honor to sit down and to listen to somebody's story from beginning to end. With that in mind, um, there are a couple tips and tricks to help make sure that you get the best interview possible. Uh, when possible, we suggest that you work in a team. What that means is if you are the interviewer, it would be great to bring a buddy along so that they could work the media. You don't have to worry about that at that point in time. And they can also help take notes. Um, another thing that's always encouraged is even if it's just five minutes before the interview, sit down and you know have small talk with the veteran. Uh, it could be a phone call, a, what we call a, a pre-interview, to make sure that you get to know them. Our questions uh, start with basic biographical information, as I had mentioned, but they really kind of build. So we start with the easy lobs um, to get people started, and then we get into some more specific questions. So again, you want to make sure that you're asking these open-ended, not very specific questions. If you are using a mobile device, uh, you are going to want to make sure you have ample room. We have found that technically it's, I think it's about four gigs that you're going to need on your mobile device if you are doing a video. Um, I think it's down to two or even one if you're doing simply audio. That being said, I always advise that you do a redundant copy of the interview as well. So when we travel, I typically will have a tablet that's recording the video, and then I have my cell phone, which is on airplane mode, uh, to record the audio component of that. The airplane mode is really, really great because nothing will ruin an oral history faster than having a phone call or text message come through. So I, I just wanna emphasize that. if somebody's in the middle of a pivotal you know, part of their story and the phone rings, probably not going to make for the best time. Um, you want to try to avoid chairs that swivel or rock as best you can, because even if the veteran is comfortable speaking on camera, it's possible that they may get a little bit nervous. Um, another thing you want to do is you want to make sure to show that you're engaged. And there are a lot of really great ways to do that without asking questions necessarily. You can lean forward a little bit, nodding your head, nonverbal cues, even just positioning your feet towards that person is going to make them feel that much more um, that much more comfortable. Um, these stories, I will be just brutally honest with you, they're not always going to be the best of the best. And certainly we don't want that. We're not a, a propaganda piece. We want that real experience, the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything in between. Um, that being said, I typically advise that you work out with the veteran some sort of cue in case you want to stop the video. We ask for the raw content, so the unedited video. What that means is we don't need any fancy graphics, um, but also we don't want somebody to go in and edit something that may not be important for them, but is important for the family member or maybe to a researcher who's gonna come along later. So we do ask for the raw video, but please know that if you need to stop for any reason, tickle in the throat, emotional re reaction, any of those are game, you can go ahead and take a break. I typically will work out with the uh, individual, just a cue that's kind of like a, a wave of the hand directly off screen. It's a really good sign that they need to maybe take a second and collect themselves. Another thing that's kind of awkward uh, is that as human beings, we tend to want to fill the silence. It gets awkward, but it's possible that the person who you're speaking with needs just a beat to remember what it was that they were gonna say. Or maybe they're, they're taking that intentionally. So I would certainly urge you to lean into that silence and give it just an extra beat just even an extra more than what you're comfortable with um, so that they can go ahead and proceed forward. Another thing is I know a lot of the individuals on here are probably pretty uh, pretty comfortable with military jargon. 
but that doesn't mean that the high school student who watches this oral history is going to be familiar with that. So I would encourage you to ask for uh, jargon to be further explained or for anything that maybe other individuals and outsider may not necessarily know. Uh, so if there's any anecdotes or anything, please feel free to have them go ahead and explain them. If they have a political statement, that's fine. They can go ahead and include that. Uh, ultimately, we want to be respectful that this is their opportunity to tell it as they experienced it. Those are all great suggestions. I know we also talked earlier about making sure that a tripod is used to hold the camera steady. So if you're using your cell phone or a, an iPad or something like that, a tablet, it's, it's really hard to hold it steady for that length of time. And I, as an underwater filmmaker, go crazy when I see the phone held this way. Yeah. So make sure you turn it so that you've got that widescreen shot. That's the better way of, of getting it. And then another hint that I usually use when I do an interview is even if I've got the camera set up, I'm close to it. I'm close enough to make sure I'm not recording my own hair, but that I've got that interviewer that's, that's looking at, at me and, and I'm making eye contact and we're having a good dialogue that way and I still get a decent shot out of it. It helps take the nervousness out of the fact that there's a camera there because not everybody's comfortable speaking on camera. Exactly. And I love that this photo portrays exactly what you should not be doing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So not just about the oral history recordings, but you, you talked about a lot of artifacts. So what sort of artifacts are you looking for? Um, what do you accept? And are there any rules that go along with those? Yes, absolutely. So we are looking for original content. Um, what that means is original letters, original diary entries, original photographs. We do not take any uniforms or uh, medals. However, you can wear it in your, your oral history filming, or you could even send in a picture of that. Uh, sometimes saying original can be a sticking point for some individuals. Completely understand. I mentioned we can be a bit of a greedy archive, but certainly we don't want to take anything if somebody's not quite ready to give those items. Um, if it's something you're debating, I will just throw out that there are a couple positive reasons uh, that you should consider donating it, not necessarily just to us, but to an archive. Uh, the number one thing is safety. Um, number two is security. And lastly is to increase the research value. The library has a humidity controlled and climate controlled facility um, in which we keep these items. Uh, this is a great collection. This is one of our World War I collections, and this is Albert John Carpenter. He was a 19-year-old college student when he headed over to France to fight in the Great War, and he kept a pocket diary about the size of our cell phones today, and he starts his diary with October, the most eventful month of my life. And he goes on, he talks about his buddies, but he talks about the gassing, he talks about the artillery, he talks about the mudding. He talks about everything that we've learned about the Great War. And he comes home and he just locks his diary away. He never talked about it to any family members. And after he passed away, the family members found this diary. It was in the hall closet with the family Bible and other important documents. His daughter-in-law, Shirley, started asking the family if something should be done. It's, it's loose leaf at this point. It's got tears. It's got water damage. It just, it's, it's a bit of a disaster at this point. So she wanted to send it somewhere where it could be properly cared for. Um, we were very lucky that she chose to send it to us, uh, not just because we now have it in our archive, but also because, as you can see from the screen, Hurricane Katrina had paid her home a visit and everything was under five and a half feet of water. So this diary and the one photograph we have from Albert John Carpenter would have been lost forever had they not had the foresight to donate this collection. I want to go into the, the next slide if we could. Um, one of the things that's kind of neat is that we have this world-class preservation and conservation lab at the Library of Congress. Uh, the tears that I had mentioned were able to be repaired with Japanese tissue paper. And the pages that were so badly damaged from the water uh, with a proprietary chemical under ultraviolet light for the first time ever, the family was able to see what was intended to be written on those pages. I just, uh, 
so very, very cool. Um, this was a collection that was also featured at our um, centennial for World War I. We had a really great exhibit at the library. And um, the family was just ecstatic to be included in this and to have Albert John Carpenter featured in such a way. Um, in fact, it, the story goes just one step further because the family members had loved ones who were getting married and they found out that their new in-laws, actually uh, their grandfather had served in the same unit as Albert John Carpenter. So it's really great to think that such a simple act sparked such a neat conversation that they may never have had and they may never have known what was intended to be written on those pages. But it's so nice to know that those artifacts are being that respectfully cared for. That's great. Now, how how many collections do you receive? You said you've got two pallets waiting for you. So, you know, how long does it take to go through that and review them and process them? It does take some time. Um, Sometimes the collections we receive will be one oral history. And sometimes uh, I think I had mentioned that, you know, with the World War I collections, those can be really uh, need a little bit extra TLC. And um, about a year ago, we received a collection that was 700 photographs from World War I and 900 letters. So because mm -hmm. collections span so greatly, um, it really kind of takes some time for us to kind of dig through. Um, the first thing that we do is we, when we receive a collection, we do ask that all collections are sent to us via commercial courier, which I know seems kind of strange, but if anybody remembers the anthrax scare we had some years ago up here at Washington um, on Capitol Hill, we now have all of our mail radiated. So we want to make sure that those items do not get damaged. And so we ask for things to be sent via commercial courier because those items are hand swept. Uh, so once those items do reach us, the first thing we do is we check for the required paperwork. Uh, the second thing that we do is we make sure that all of those minimum qualifications are met. Just really quickly, those minimum qualifications, there is no maximum. Just want to share. Um, in fact, I received one oral history that was 12 hours long. So, um, so we want to make sure that all of those minimum qualifications are met. And then the third thing that we do is we assess them for preservation and conservation needs. Uh, the photo back here shows a family photo album that was sent to us. And um, while we love getting collections like this, we're also hyper aware of the fact that the glue contains a, a specific amount of acidity that over time will erode the photos and meld the paper completely into the photographs. So, um, so again, it does take some time for us to go ahead and do that. Typically, we ask for four to six weeks. Um, right now, unfortunately, we don't have anybody at the library to process these collections, so it probably would take a little bit longer. Um, so please don't feel that you have to rush and get these off through those commercial couriers to us um, anytime soon. The first thing that does happen, though, is when we receive a collection and we have gone through to make sure that they meet the minimums and all of that, we send a postcard back to the contributor to let them know that we've received it and we're working on it. So even if you don't hear from us or don't see it digitized and available online, it doesn't mean we're not necessarily working on it. The first thing that's made available is the biographical data form. So that essentially DD214 from the field kit is the first thing that's made available on our, um, on our online database. And anybody who's interested in learning a little bit more who maybe can't find it on the website is, uh, again, able to email us and we'll be able to work with you. And once the buildings are open back up, we'll be able to greet visitors and to um, administer collections that way. Wow, amazing. Okay, so we've all got a lot of work to do, audience out there. We've got some things to put together. You know, Carrie, you talked about the making a veteran feel comfortable, but do you find that some veterans are reluctant to talk about their stories? Absolutely. I would say most of the veterans I meet are very humble and uh, participating in something like an oral history, they, they want to make sure they don't come across as a braggart. Um, and beyond that, you know, a lot of veterans, as I had mentioned before, they say, oh, I didn't have a story. I didn't really do that much. Um, but I can guarantee you that that's not necessarily the case. Um, a perfect example of this is Heather Sandler, and Heather comes from a long line of military service. Her uncles, her brothers, her father, everybody had served in various branches, 
and Heather decided to serve in the United States Navy. Uh, she served on board the um, USS Abraham Lincoln during Operation Iraqi Freedom. And um, she served in the Navy for 10 years. And part of what her role was, was loading armament on F-18s. And I mean, when she speaks through her oral history and some of the photographs that she sent us, it wasn't all, um, it wasn't all fun. You know, she speaks about some of the times that weren't necessarily fun. And so after she left um, her career in the Navy, she uh, volunteered with the VA and she also was working with a member of Congress. And one of the volunteers at the VA had asked if she would consider participating and sharing a little bit more about her experience through an oral history. Heather didn't understand, it just didn't compute. Why would somebody wanna know more about what her specific experience was like? Um, but she got talked into it, not necessarily for her, but for her children. She wanted to make sure her children would know what their mom had done in the United States Navy. Um, she dressed up, I think, once or twice uh, to go in for Veterans Day, but that was pretty much it. So um, it really was this tremendous gift that Heather was able to give to her family because, as you can see from the screen, it wasn't exactly something she wanted to talk about, but in the end, it was an extremely cathartic experience for her. Now, Heather went on to write a beautiful blog, if anybody's interested in, in taking a peek more about what her experience was. It's featured on the, the VA's website. And uh, she also was showcased because of, you know, the opportunity to share her story. She was showcased at the Atlanta Hartsfield Airport. If anybody's been walking through, they have a Hall of Heroes area. And Heather was featured right up there as well because she chose to share her story. That's excellent. So what happens to the collections after they're received at the Library of Congress? Oh, that's great. So I, as you can hear from Heather's story, they really don't just sit on the shelves acquiring dust, um, but rather they are used on a regular basis, whether that's through the, the researchers, the library displays, um, or occasionally we do have an opportunity to shine a spotlight on some neglected honor. Um, another really important factor that is mentioned in the field kit in the release forms is in regards to copyright. The Library of Congress houses the Copyright Office and therefore we're real sticklers for copyright. And we consider ourselves the keeper of these stories but not the owner of these stories. So while we may use it in some of our educational materials, if somebody wants to use it in exhibit, if they want to use it in publication, we send them back to the veteran or the next of kin to make sure that their story is told in a really great, appropriate way. Um, if anybody saw some of those PBS specials that Ken Burns had done, uh, he got a lot of the inspiration from the stories within our collection. And we sent him back to the veterans and the next of kin to dig a little bit deeper about those stories. Um, the book that's featured up there, uh, that really kind of is neat because we have over 800 different books that cite Veterans History Project as a primary resource, which is just incredible to think about how much history and how much specific experience uh, that it can lend to these books. One really great example of that is the Code Girls book, um, which Liza Mundy had published in which she kind of unearthed these hidden figures. Um, during World War II, as a lot of the men were off fighting, they had turned to women's colleges. Uh, these women who had showed an affinity for math and science may have received this little secret postcard asking if they were engaged to be married and if they were good at puzzles. And if they answered correctly, they may have been recruited for part of this top secret code breaking mechanism, some in Washington DC with the United States Navy. Um, the whole time these women were supposed to share that they were secretaries. That's all they were doing. They were just secretaries. Um, and for a lot of them, they kept this secret and they took it to their grave. Others talked a little bit more. Um, we have a docent at the library whose mother was a code girl, wasn't very good at keeping secrets. So rather than say she was a secretary, she chose to tell everyone she was a showgirl. She figured there'd be fewer questions with that one. So, um, so Liza Money wrote this beautiful book. We had approximately 20 collections that she was able to pull from of different individuals who gave just a hint of what their experience was like. And Liza was able to take it a step further to interview them, to interview the families. And then um, a year after we invited Liza to have a book talk at the library, 
we actually had the first ever Code Girls reunion at the Library of Congress. And we had five of the original Code Girls all in their 90s come out and share a little bit about what their experience was like. Um, included in that, we had approximately 40 family members who came out, participated in a little promenade in which they held the photo of their loved one who was a Code Girl. They also had an opportunity to chat with each other, which was kind of yeah. interesting because, you know, a lot of them hadn't talked about their experiences and this was a, a whole new thing for them. They didn't know there were other code girls out there. And included in the, the family members was Bill Nye, the science guy, um, DC local, and uh, his mom was pretty good at science. So um, so that's a great way to, to highlight the fact that we really are wanting the veterans and the next of kin to maintain their copyright for a good reason. And then lastly, the, the mention of shining a spotlight on neglected honor um, lends itself to the, the story of Lieutenant Colonel Charles Kettles. Charles Kettles was, uh, wasn't so sure about sharing his story either. A volunteer from Ypsilanti had asked if he would sit down. Charles Kettles invited him over to his home, laid out on his dining room table all of these huge maps about where he was in Vietnam. He had served as a UH-1D uh, helicopter pilot and he's credited for saving 40 men's lives. There was an ambush and he volunteered to go in once, twice, three times. The interviewer just couldn't believe his ears. So he started asking, digging a little bit more about who some of these 40 men were. He started to interview them. And then with a uh, push from some congressional action, nearly 50 years after the fact, Charles Kettles received the Medal of Honor. And while this is certainly the exception to the story, it does highlight the importance of what sharing these stories really can do. Decades or even hundreds of years from now, people won't have to wonder what it was like for individuals who had served because they'll be able to hear directly from those individuals who did have that front row seat at history. What a critical job you have. I mean, that's so important. Well, Carrie, you've shared with us so much information in, in this last 40, 50 minutes. And I know we've got some questions coming in, but you know, I'm going to ask first, since uh, you know, I have the interviewer prerogative there. When we originally talked about this, I asked you, you know, half of my family is Canadian. So I, you know, I can't submit those to you, can I? Or what happens if it's a foreign service? So I'm actually really glad that you'd mentioned that because as I alluded to before, we're not the only organization out there who's doing something like this. Um, I think Canada has a, uh, I think it's called the Memory Project in Canada, where they're doing something very similar. And I believe that there are other organizations um, throughout the world who are trying to set this up as well to make sure that their service members are remembered as well. Absolutely. Um, we do have on our website because understandably we're not necessarily going to be the right archive for anybody. So again, I would encourage individuals to take a peek at our website. We do have alternate repositories that they could consider donating to. Super. Thanks. Now I know Leah is behind the scenes. She's our voice of God back there. So we'll see if she's got questions coming in. I'm, I imagine we've got quite a few here. Well, again, sorry about the delay and the technical difficulties, but it looks like we've got it worked out. Um, one of the questions is they people want to know what some of the more interesting things they should, if they want to go and see something really fascinating, what should they go look for in the archive? I think it's a little bit different for everybody. Um, you know, I was at the 2ID reunion, and I had just listened to some, just an incredible story, extremely harrowing. And I went from that to a man who had served as an admin officer, and his role was stateside, but he shared with me that apparently paper clips were a hot commodity. And if he gathered up enough paper clips, he could trade them in for cherry pie. Um, and it's just those little things that I find, you know, so compelling. Um, I think I, I had shared a little bit about um, a man who had gone through his first battle in World War II. I guess I'm, I'm a little stuck on the food ones, I'll preface it with that, but a man who had just uh, gone through his first battle as a Marine, a young Marine, and um, he had survived on Tulagi on confiscated Japanese rice for about two weeks. And so when he was finally rescued, and a boat picked him up, 
he talks in his oral history about this beautiful man, this beautiful sailor who gave him a can of peaches. Seems like such an ordinary thing for us, but the way he describes it after surviving on this rice, he describes it like champagne. And he just, you know, he's blown away by how beautiful this man was who handed him a can of peaches. So to me, I, you know, I'm not necessarily as interested in some of the, the stories that we've heard, but rather some of those really kind of intimate stories that we probably would never have a chance to learn about because they're not necessarily in history books or in featured in movies. Um, but to take it one step further, I would encourage anybody who's interested in taking a peek, uh, check out that Experiencing War that's featured on our website. That picture, when you click on it, you'll find something like 67 different themes. And uh, whatever interests you, you can do a slightly deeper dive on some of those themes. So another question is, is there an area that you need more information on? So I, I guess, okay, that may, that's a good, that makes sense. Because if people are asking, you know, is there something you need? What can they help you with? So we do have deficits in the collection. Um, I think because we came into this 20 years ago with the mind frame that we did, we wanted to make sure to preserve these stories before it was too late. So the majority of the collections we have are actually World War II. Um, that being said, I don't want to discourage anybody to go out there and to interview their neighbor who's a World War II veteran or their grandfather who's a World War II veteran because um, those stories are equally as important and we really can't have enough of those and honor those individuals enough. Um, that being said, we have found that women love to volunteer to sit down and conduct these oral histories, but uh, fewer women want to sit down and participate. The VA states that approximately 9% of the veteran population are women. And as much as we want our collections to mirror that, sadly, we only have 6% of our collection are stories told by women. Um, another one is uh, we are continuing to branch out and we have a lot of individuals who are over in Puerto Rico who are serving. Um, those are those are little deficits that we have within the collection that we're working really hard to try to build back up to make sure that we have that more accurate representation of military service. So, uh, another question, do you have a way to fact check the oral histories? I love that question. Um, the reason I love that question is because we are um, we are the Veterans History Project underneath the umbrella of the American Folk Life Center. So um, when I'm talking about the human experience and I'm talking about the fact that the fish may start this big, but your memory has it being this big, um, there's actually a reason. And sociologists and psychologists who delve a little bit more into the collections, they actually pair their research back with some of the, the historical research. That way they know that it's not necessarily going to be verbatim fact. So we don't, we don't necessarily um, fact check those. Uh, if anybody has any question about oral history that they have heard and they know it's just clearly not right, uh, we do take stolen valor very seriously and we would encourage you to reach out. Um, you can see my email and uh, my desk phone, which is currently patched through to my cell phone here, um, are both listed on here. I would encourage you to reach out and let us know that there's something on there that you're not, you're not thinking is, is quite right. And again, if you have any further questions, I would encourage you to, to reach out. That's it. Those are all the questions that we have so far. So thank you guys very much. Oh, awesome. of course. Yeah, I just, Kira, again, you is... Go ahead. I just was gonna say thank you uh, again for the opportunity. Thank you for everybody who's online, who's wanting to know a little bit more. And beyond that, anybody who, takes the time to just sit with somebody and get to know them in that really intimate way. Carrie, this has just been a pleasure. This, this hour with you has flown by. You've given us so much great information. And I think I, I speak on behalf of, of both you and me when I say that I really hope that our audience will utilize and contribute to the Veterans History Project because it really is a worthy project. And um, it certainly, is uh, 
is something that is near and dear to my heart, your heart, and I think those in our audience too. We're we're part of the CAF because we care about those stories. So this is great work. So we hope that our audience is going to help support the Veterans History Project. And then if you like what we're doing with the CAF, I hope you'll support the CAF as well. So thank you for that. And then we're looking forward to next week on May 27th at 2 p.m. Central Daylight Time. We've got filmmakers, Kara and Adam White, who are gonna give us a peek behind the curtains of what it's like to create the film Rise Above Wasp. So again, Carrie, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and stay safe. Take care of yourself and audience. Thank you so much for joining us.